Matthew and Luke rewrote Mark. They do not like it. They hate some of the ideas there, and they simply either remove them or recast them so that the original meaning of Mark does not come through. Dr. James E. Tabor, you just did a course with MVP Courses, Creating Jesus, Why Mark's Gospel Was Forgotten. But I have a further question. Why did Matthew and Luke hate the Gospel of Mark? Well, look, for years I've taught Mark, and I don't even think I would have said that until recently as I really thought through it. I used to just tell the students, hey, Matthew and Luke had Mark as a source, and either they edited it, that's a nice neutral term, or they rewrote it. Then I began to talk about how they overwrote it, which is like you're covering it up. And I would say at this point, they just don't like it. And I'm using hate uh, in the sense of like really, really not wanting it to uh, stand. And so they're recasting it in that sense. Let me give you just some examples. Some are obvious, like Mark doesn't have the birth of Jesus. Think about that, the Christmas story, shepherds singing at night, wise men coming, all the things people think of at Christmas, not in Mark. And the ending, not even to have Jesus appearing gloriously with the earthquake and the angels coming and he's raised from the dead, he doesn't have any of that. And the course goes into that very thoroughly. But I picked a few examples more specific. I mean, those are obvious. When people start reading Mark, they immediately, if they've read Matthew already, they tend to forget it because they think, well, I've already read this. They don't pay attention. Mark wrote first. The priority of Mark is a pillar of New Testament scholarship. So Mark is our earliest source. But people don't even tend to read it. In this course, we pull Mark out of the New Testament, almost like tear it out and you get your separate copy of Mark. And the whole idea is to let Mark be Mark. Let's hear Mark as he really was. Now here's some quick examples. Uh, there's a story early on in Mark chapter two that occurs in Matthew 12 because he has other materials that he puts in, so different chapters. And Jesus is accused by his enemies of breaking the Sabbath by harvesting grain, even though they're just taking a little bit and eating it when they're famished. And in Mark, Jesus basically says, well, David broke the law. I guess I'm breaking the law. And uh, you know what? Laws are for people, not people for laws. So if I'm breaking the law, this, the Sabbath's made for people. So he didn't really defend it as you would in Judaism to say, no, this is the command and you better do it. Well, Matthew doesn't like that. I, I, I'll say he hates that. He hates that. He thinks, well, wait a minute. If you start telling people they can decide how to keep laws, you're going to get chaos. Mark doesn't mind the chaos because he believes that the end is near. And in this time of the end, we go back to Eden, so to speak, back to this original gospel or message of the Hebrew Bible. Now you say, well, why would you say gospel? Because for Jesus, this call back to the kingdom of God is a kind of return. It's good news, in other words, that the time has arrived, the kingdom of God is near. That's the whole theme of Mark. The question is, what is the kingdom of God? So what does Matthew do with that? He presents Jesus as the authority figure. Why does he, quote, break the Sabbath? Because he's greater than the temple. He's greater than anything in Judaism. That is, it's the figure of Jesus and his authority that Matthew likes. There's another example in Mark where a man comes up to Jesus and calls him good. He says, good master, good rabbi, literally. What do I do to inherit eternal life? And in Mark, Jesus rebukes the man. He says, why are you calling me good? There's one good God pointing to the one God of Israel, the Shema, as Jews call it today. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. No other gods beside him. Well, Matthew would not object to that. He's Jewish. But what he doesn't like is Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's one good God, because he has a very high view of what we would call the divinity of Jesus. And if somebody reads Mark, they could think, well, wait, so Jesus 
rebukes the guy for giving him even the respect of good rabbi and says only God is good. Another example is this wise scribe in Mark. It's in Mark chapter 12. And he's a Pharisee, basically. And he's the only one commended in the entire Gospel of Mark. And I'm not even going to tell you right now why he's commended. But think about that. The only one commended for understanding the kingdom of God is a Pharisee, a scribe in the temple. Guess what Matthew does with that? He just takes that part out. He has Jesus teaching in the temple. But as far as the scribe answering wisely and being commended, gone, takes it out. There are other examples of this widow in Mark, very at the end, it's the very one of the last stories. She gives all that she has, the famous widow's mites. And uh, guess what? Look for it in Matthew. Why wouldn't it be there? What's wrong with a widow giving all that she has? Because he says, this widow gave more than all that we're doing in the temple. It, it, it in a sense says that this poor widow giving the money is more than all of the practices of the temple of Jerusalem and everything else. So Matthew has a problem with that. Again and again, as he goes through Mark, he revises, he takes out. And I would say it's not too strong to say that he intensely dislikes, I know hate is a strong word, but he absolutely takes this stuff out and changes it. What about Luke? The biggest example in Luke is when uh, you get to chapter 6 of Mark, 645 through 826. That's two chapters. Luke just takes them out. So you got to ask, why would he skip two chapters in Mark and literally just scissor them out? That's the section where Jesus begins to really rebuke his disciples and get really down on them and say things like, you don't understand? How are you going to understand? And rebuking them. And at one point he says, are you without understanding? How are you going to understand anything? And Luke just takes that out. Uh, the rebuking of Peter. This is so climactic in Mark where Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're not on the side of God, but of men. I mean, that's pretty strong. Luke just takes it out. He doesn't want any rebuking of Peter. Uh, what about my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The last words of Jesus on the cross in Mark. Look for it in Luke. It's not there. So I'm just giving you a few examples but I don't think it's too strong to say that as Matthew and Luke rewrote Mark, they do not like it. They hate some of the ideas there, and they simply either remove them or recast them so that the original meaning of Mark does not come through. I'm not saying they would you know, go into fistfights if they met each other. These, this has to do with emerging theological ideas, and you want to, creating Jesus, the course, is about the earliest view of Jesus, our earliest account of the story of Jesus. And the point is that story got lost and forgotten because it was subsumed and overwritten by these two other Gospels, Matthew and Luke, which are so grandiose. Ladies and gentlemen, get the course. You do not want to miss it. It is the earliest story about Jesus. So if you want to get close as you can to understanding a potential historical Jesus or anything that might be related to Jesus, this is your best chance. And uh, Dr. Tabor, I appreciate your time.